Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God has given to us work to do. And when we look at the passage of Scripture that we're going to study, we're going to see that a great aspect that relates to this work, this calling in our life, is what is said, the ministry of reconciliation. To bring individuals into intimacy, an eternal intimacy with God through the gospel. Take out your Bible and look with me to where we left off last week. We are in the midst of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians and we're going to begin in verse 11. Now, just a word of review. God has given us great encouragement in the first half of this chapter. He says, if we should be away from home. And he puts this in various terms. God and his word, we see figurative language but it's clearly revealed what the intent of these figures are. So if we're at home in this body, it simply means we're alive. We're here. We have this earthly life. We reside in this world. But to be in this world, at home in this body, he told us last week, we are apart we are distant. We are not with Messiah in that same way that we're going to know him and be with him in the kingdom of God. So we learned about this word that can mean being at home, at home, or away from home. We learned that at home in this body, there's a distance, there's a separation from being with the Lord. But when we are out of this body, to be out of this body means that we will be in a new home, this eternal dwelling with Messiah. That's our, our hope. And other places, and I receive numerous emails about this, always do when this subject is brought up. But it's very important that we understand that the term sleep is simply, simply a colloquium for death. It does not speak about some state of unconsciousness, that when a person dies who is a believer, they remain there until the rapture, until the establishment of the kingdom. We don't see that when we look at Scripture that speaks about those who have died, they have consciousness. We see that, in the account of, of Lazarus and the rich man, none of them were, were sweet, sleeping. So we need to understand the language, how the Bible reveals things. And now it's going to speak with that assurance that we have, that, that hope, that promise, that we have a future with God, that we are, in fact, going to leave this body and be present with him because of that. It should cause us to think differently about how we live now because of that future hope, that assurance that we're going to spend eternity in his presence. What should that cause us to do now in, in whatever amount of time we have left in this world? So this is some of the overwhelming context for understanding what we're going to, to learn today in this section. Let's begin. Verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, very important word. It is a type of conjunction. It's a word of transition. 
Having been taught what we learned last week in light of that, he says, knowing the fear of the Lord. Now, this term for fear of the Lord, it's a Greek word where we get the English word phobia from. And it's simply being afraid. Now, a phobia from the Greek perspective could be something that is one that imagines something or it can be a legitimate threat, something that, that rightly should cause fear. In this case, he's speaking about the wrath of God. In light of the fact that God is wrathful, that he will judge sin, in light of that, we should respond. In light of the fact that to be in his presence, we need to have a new home, a, a new body, a new reality for us. And that reality is only an outcome of the gospel receiving it. So he says here, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, some Bibles will translate this word fear, the terror, referring to the threat of God's eternal judgment. In light of that, because we know that, and what is the best example of the wrath of God? The answer is the cross. The fact that Messiah would be commanded to die in a death on a cross tells us that God's judgment, that his wrath is real. We better understand that God's not going to simply wink or ignore or think lightly of sin. The cross says such thoughts are, are misplaced. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, men we persuade to God. In other words, knowing that the wrath of God is real. We, and he's speaking here about believers, those who have received Messiah, who have believed the truth, who have brought themselves under the authority of God's word. It says, we therefore are going to do something knowing the reality of wrath. We are going to persuade men to God, meaning to enter into a covenant with God, to be with God. And this word with, when it's with God, there's only one means that allows one to be with God. And what is that? It is redemption. So, Knowing the fear of the Lord, men we persuade to be with God. And there he says, because of that, we are manifested. Now, that word is a word of appearing. And in this context, it might best be understood as being transparent. We show ourselves. We reveal ourselves. In one sense, what he's saying is, this is why we've come. This is why we've appeared in Corinth. This was our objective. Knowing God's wrath, we want to persuade individuals, those in Cor Corinth and other places, that they be reconciled to God through redemption. This is why we have been manifested. Then he goes on and I hope also in your conscience, it says, being manifested, meaning this. We hope that not only have we been manifested before you in your, before your eyes that you've seen us, but you have been able from your conscience to discern us, to come to know us, our motivation, our purpose, why we have been manifested. Not that you've just seen us, but your conscience has revealed, confirms why we're here. Because of the reality of God's judgment. This has caused us to manifest ourselves before you. Verse, verse 12. For not again ourselves we are commending. He says, we're not here to, to seek your approval. We're not here commending ourselves once more so that you uh, like us, 
that you uh, uh, follow us, that you, it's not about us is what he's saying. It has nothing to do with us, but the purposes of God. So look again at verse 12, for not again ourselves we commend to you, but an opportunity. Now, this word is so significant. He's saying, our coming to you has given to you a spiritual opportunity. Do not ignore spiritual opportunities. God sends someone to share a word of truth, to give a revelation, to reveal a prophetic prophetic truth we hear that it's an opportunity a spiritual opportunity is almost without exception connected to eternity it will have eternal implication so don't ignore that don't reject it as the scripture says other places do not today harden your heart to that don't become stubborn don't ignore the movement of the Spirit in your midst. So he says, it's not about us commending ourselves to you, but rather, he says, a opportunity being given to you in order to boast in behalf of us. Now, this word boasting, it's a word of of stating something, revealing something publicly. More often than not, uh, uh, we find that word boasting, but it can also be understood as rejoicing. You boast about that which is good, that which is pleasing, that which brings joy into your life. So Paul is saying not that, that we want the attention, but rather it gives you the opportunity to boast, to rejoice, and what he's speaking about in a general sense is it gives you the opportunity to bear witness, to, to testify, to reveal something to who? He says, in, in rejoicing in our behalf in order that you should have before the ones in appearance, literally, of the face rejoice now there's certain people that that for them everything you've heard the expression seeing is believing so he's saying we want to be transparent we have come we have behaved we have acted in order to bring about a spiritual change You've seen our commitment. You've seen our conduct. And it's not to bring attention to ourselves, but rather to give you an opportunity to rejoice publicly before those who only pay attention to what they see with their eyes rather than notice what, what you should do. And that is by the heart. Now, the heart is a word of, of thought as a man thinks in his heart. It's a word of perception, a word of discernment. So many times in the Bible, when the word heart is, is stated, just like we say, I believe that with all my heart. My heart tells me that. It's a idiom for discernment, not speaking about that physical organ, the heart, but rather that inner dimension that we ponder, that we think hard. So he's saying here, there are those people that, that they're not going to ever really ponder things, reflect upon things inwardly to derive and arrive at the truth. They are just going to make decisions based upon what they see. So, so now you can boast, you can rejoice, you can testify concerning us on how we have lived and for what purpose. In other words, Paul is saying here that it is discernible, it is visible. Their 
commitment to God, their manner of conduct, their behavior, what they're doing, why they appeared in Corneth. Because they sincerely believe that God is wrathful, that God will judge sinners. Verse 13. For, and he uses the word, and it's a word of, of sense, because, this, or that. It speaks about a dichotomy. The word appears twice. So he's going to give two situations. And usually, and I mention the word dichotomy because two very different situations. And he says, whether, perhaps that's the best way that we can translate it, for whether we are beyond ourselves. What it is, it means to to stand outside of one sense. It is a word of, of acting uniquely. Many times people would say in a way that is not uh, perhaps dignified from a worldly standpoint, one that the world just doesn't understand or perceive. And he says, anytime that you, from a worldly perspective, think that we are behaving in an unusual manner and that which is, is odd, not not fitting to society's norms. He says, we do so unto God. It is our service, our commitment. The world can't understand why we do these things because we do them for God. But rather if we should appear sober-minded, normal, he says, it is unto you. So he says, we, we want to have a testimony that you can discern, that you can appreciate, that you can can easily comprehend. But if at times there's something that seems unseemly, different, out of the norm, a little bit uh, uh, crazy, it's because we don't fit into this world. What comes into my mind is when, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about great faith, individuals that possess that great faith, what does he say? They are, are strangers. They, they just don't fit into the norm in society. They're not worthy of, of this world. So this is what Paul is saying. And what's the motivation of that? Look now to verse 14. For the love of Messiah. This love we have for Messiah compels us, judging this, that one, that since one in behalf of many died, so that with the result of that, that, that all died. Now, let me share that again. He says, for the love of Messiah compels us, judging this, we have arrived at this conclusion. That if one, and who is that one? Messiah. The love of Messiah caused him, compelled him to go to that cross. And therefore, that same love of Messiah says that if one, and it's really since because one, in behalf of all died. And this is important because he died for all, all of humanity. For God so loved the world. So one Messiah, he died in behalf of all. In order that, notice what he says, or with the result of, therefore, all died. Now, he's sharing here. When Messiah died upon that tree, you know what? His death brought death to humanity. How do we understand this? Well, very simply. We know that he, we talked about this in the call to worship. We're going to deal with it more more significantly at the end, at our last verse of tonight's study. But Messiah became sin for us. Meaning, he who never sinned, he became sin, God wrecked him, laid upon him my sin, your sins, the sins of the world. That's why he died. 
What's the outcome of sin? Death. God's judgment brings death. He conquered death by rising from the dead, and he's going to mention that in a moment. But, but he, when he died upon the cross, all who receive him, they die too. He took the punishment, the death of all, all of humanity. He took that punishment. So in one sense, we all die. We all receive the punishment, the outcome of being Torah violators. And now look at verse 15. He repeats the same thing. And in behalf of all, he died. So we died. The first thing he says is he died. And if we receive him, we died as well. We received the judgment of God. He took it for us, but it's credited in our account. We have already received God's judgment. Why? Because of the cross. He did it in our behalf, but it was credited in our account. That's why there's so many implications of that. That we walk not under the law, but being led by the Spirit in faith. And in doing so, we fulfill the righteousness of the law. But notice what he says here. And behalf of all, he died in order that the ones living, those are believers, no longer for themselves they live. And it's in the subjunctive. No longer should we live for ourselves. You can, you ought not. But people do. And in fact, if you were to ask me what is one of the, the heresies, the, the falsehood of, of much of what's being presented to believers, is that he died so that we can live for ourselves, achieve what we want. This is false. He says it right here. Because he died for all, that means me. In order that, this is the reason why, that the ones living should no longer for themselves live, but for him or unto him, unto Messiah. For, it says, in behalf of them, he died. And not only did he die, but he also was raised. He was risen from the dead. We've talked about so many times how important that is, that, that God the Father raised him from the dead. It's a confirmation of the sufficiency, the perfection of Messiah's offering, that he totally, completely, fully, perfectly did his Father's will. So we have this, this hint of the resurrection, not just his resurrection, that's clear, but also since we died with him, we also believe in our resurrection, meaning a kingdom future. So no longer should we live for ourselves, but to him who in behalf of them, he died and was raised. Verse 16. So that. Now, this is a word, huste, which speaks about an outcome, a result. It speaks of kind of a, a chain reaction. Because this happened, this must also occur. In fact, one causes the other. One was done for this purpose. So look at verse 16. So that we, from now, from that moment, the moment that we acknowledge that, receive that, so that from now, no longer we know, that is, that we discern things, that we reckon things according to the flesh. We no longer see things from an earthly perspective, but we see things differently, not according, notice what he says, no longer do we know things according to the flesh, but since also we have known according to the flesh Messiah. Now, what does that mean? That we've known according to the flesh Messiah. Well, there's two primary interpretations of this. Doesn't mean one's right, one's wrong, but two different perspectives. We talk about from the position of Judaism, looking at the word of God, there's many facets 
Just like a diamond has many facets, so does the Word of God. And one is this. Paul is saying is that we've known him in the flesh, meaning that Messiah came in the flesh. It was, impos- it was possible, I want to say that right, it was possible to know him in the flesh, him as a person, touching him, speaking with him, hearing him, experiencing him in this world. That was possible. Now, the second possibility is that we came to know Messiah out of a, a fleshly perspective, flesh self. I did not want to experience the wrath of God. So my motivation initially was a fleshly one, a human one. I did not want to experience God's judgment. I did not want to go and be sentenced eternally to hell and thereafter the lake that burns with fire. So this is how I came to faith, knowing the the fear of the Lord. But he says, but he says, but now no longer do we know. This is not our motivation. I do not any longer live with the fear of God's wrath. If I live with the fear of God's wrath, his consuming judgment being sent into hell, possibly losing my salvation, what that does is that it causes one to have a wrong understanding, perception, view of the work of Messiah. Messiah's work was all sufficient. He accomplished the work of God, the purpose of God, the will of God perfectly so that I can have assurance. So no longer am I ever concerned about the wrath of God. As a believer, he's already taken that wrath upon himself when he died for me. Now I live for him, not out of a fear of God's wrath, but the desire to please him because I love him. And here again, it is totally an impossibility that a true believer, understanding what he did for me, his perfect love for me, when I hear I'm eternally secure, I can't lose my salvation, good, now I'm going to go out and sin. That is not the thought process of a true believer that never enters into the mind of a born-again person. That's not our nature. We don't desire sin. I don't know about you, but I pray daily as we should. Don't lead me. Do not allow me to be led into those things that are against your will, i.e. sin. I don't want to be part of sin. I want to live righteously. I want to live pleasing. Do I sometimes fail in that and sin? Yes, but that grieves me. It does not please me. I don't think I got away with something. Ha, that's not the mindset of a believer. So we read, he says again, verse 17, the same word who stay, the result of this that no longer do I live with a fleshly concern, a fleshly attitude. Why not? If anyone, the word tis, if anyone, a certain one, doesn't matter who, if anyone is in Messiah, what's the outcome? It simply says a new creation. The implication is one who is in, and this word refers to in being a covenantal relationship, in a covenantal relationship with Messiah. That's the only way, through the new covenant. So if anyone is in Messiah, what is he? A new creation. The things of the old, the old things, what happened to them? Now, it's interesting because this word passing away, is in the singular. Those old things are in the plural. Here again, most people, most commentaries never pick up on this. But what it's saying is those old things, they made up me. I am an individual. And that old me that was made up of all those things, that old me 
has passed away. That's why the change from the third person plural, those things, to the third person singular, speaking about the individual, those things aren't me, they made up my life. And now those things, along with me, I have passed away. And what's the outcome of that? He says, behold, what an important word. Behold, all things new. All things are new. And then we have the word here, gegonen. And this word speaks about something that has began in the past. It's true now and will continue to be. What is God doing? He's bringing newness, these new things into me again. Having become new, that chief verb here is in the third person singular. It speaks about the individual. Again, those new things, they accompany me. They cause me to be different. The new things aren't me. They bring about a new me. I become that new creation. That which was old passed away, that which is new has become my reality. And because of that, notice what it says, verse 18. And all the things are from God. He's the one who's brought about all these things. He's the cause of them, and he should be the recipient of all praise, all glory, all thanksgiving. He says, but all things are from God. And what did he do? reconciling us to himself. How? Only one way. Through Messiah Yeshua. So now we learn something. All things in regard to what we're talking about, God created everything, but specifically what he's speaking about, all of this is from God. And he did that for the purpose, and here's this important word, reconciliation reconciliation involves if we do a good study of that word it relates to a change a specific change that is brought about because of reconciled with god so all of this is a result of us being reconciled to him to god through messiah yeshua and if one has had that experience, it says also what's united with that, this conjunction, is that he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That means this. And this goes back to what Paul has said, why we have been manifested, why we are here, why we have, have become transparent. And that is to reconcile people to God through Messiah, and being reconciled with him, we will not know the fear of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. So be aware of something. All believer, every believer, has been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is, we are called. It is an absolute obligation to be thinking purposefully in, with intent. To, to do what Paul did, to be transparent, to be present, to be seen among others in their presence for the purpose of reconciling them to God through Messiah Yeshua. That is what we have been given. And until we act upon that, we're not going to know other things, other purpose, what God has for us in our life. Verse, verse 19. As that God was in Messiah. Now, I believe a couple translations will say to wit. As an outcome, because of this, simply says here, as. As this is the case that God was in Messiah, great text to speak about, about the divinity of Messiah. God did it through Messiah, the uniqueness of their, their, their oneness. As that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, meaning this, God is going to bring a change to all 
of creation. The world, cosmos, creation, the world. God will bring a change. Every aspect of this world is going to be dealt with based upon reconciliation. That which is not reconciled to God, that which is unreconciled, is going to experience the judgment, the wrath of God. They are going to be recipients of of his consuming wrath. So he says, as that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, and not, how did he reconcile those ones in the world that received the gospel? It says, not reckoning to them their transgressions. Here's the promise. God, because of Messiah, God worked through Messiah in order that he would not reckon, not account, not recognize their transgressions. He wouldn't do that. Why? Because they have been dealt with. They have been forgiven. And once more, he says, and set in us the word. And this is the plan, the purpose of reconciliation. So now, because he does not reckon, account, charge us with our sins. Why? Because we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. He has set upon us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Therefore, in behalf of Messiah, we, and it's a word, Many English translations will say ambassador. And in Messiah, we have become ambassadors. Now, I would say that is true, but it's not the word ambassador. It's the word, many of you know the word uh, presbytery. Presbytery refers to the word for elder. If you have a Presbyterian congregation, it is an elder led those who are mature lead that that assembly so the word presbytery is simply that which is of maturity that which has age that which is older and what what paul is saying here is this and therefore in behalf of messiah he's saying we are mature we are the elders and with that comes authority a God-given, an authority subjected to the will, the purpose, the revelation of God. He says we are mature, and therefore we have authority as, as God. What do we do? As God, we encourage. You be encouraged through us to do what? He says that we encourage, that you should be encouraged through us to seek in behalf of Messiah, what? That you should be reconciled. Now, I want to talk a moment about this word. This is the, I believe, the third time we've seen this word for reconcile. And what he says is, we are encouraging you that that you should be encouraged to be reconciled, to be reconciled to God. But there's something, again, that more often than not is ignored. It is incumbent upon people to study God's Word. And to do so means not just that you read it in your language, but you go a little bit deeper than that. And even if you're only doing one verse a day, you are going to be amazed in a year, two years, five years, what you learn from studying thoroughly just one verse a day. Because when we read it and how most uh, Bibles translate it, it simply says, you be reconciled to God. And that usually implies, okay, what do I have to do? But it's very, very significant. Two things. This is in the imperative, which means it's command. He's commanding you, be reconciled. The second thing, this word, be reconciled, most people don't identify. This is in the passive, which means what? I need to be reconciled, but I can't do it myself. 
It's got to be done for me. I have to be a recipient of reconciliation. And that comes as an outcome of the ministry of Messiah. And his ministry continues through individuals. So when someone has that word of reconciliation, shares it, and encourages others, cause for them to be reconciled, it is to receive reconciliation. I don't reconcile myself. No, the word here means I will be, I will become a recipient of God's reconciliation to him, to himself by Messiah. And now, last verse, we began with this verse for our call to worship. We'll conclude with it tonight. It's a word that speaks about a proper understanding of this work of reconciliation. How did it happen? Well, we've already spoken about it. There's been hints. Why did Messiah die? He died because he received the punishment of sin. Death is a punishment of sin. Let me say it another way. Death is the punishment of violating the law of God, the Torah of God. So we read here, for one who did not know sin. Now, the word for not knowing sin is in the heiress, and it's a word, a tense of entirety. We could say he never, ever knew. He had no connections whatsoever with sin. Sin was foreign to him, but God did something. It says, for the one who did not know sin in behalf of us. God didn't benefit from this. Messiah didn't benefit from this. It had nothing to do to bring something that they lacked, something that they needed into reality. It was all for us. I need to be saved. I need this reconciliation. I need this forgiveness. It's for me. God gave it to me, and I should be eternally thankful, and my life daily at all times should reflect that I've been reconciled, and I am grateful for that. So he says, for the one who did not know sin, in behalf of us, sin he made, meaning God made this one to be sin. Why? He laid the sins of us upon him so that he would take the punishment and we would not. And not being punished, therefore, we could, we could enjoy eternal life, kingdom life. So Messiah received the punishment so that we could be free and be reconciled, having the righteousness of God being upheld through God's judgment of sin upon Messiah. So the one who did not know sin, in behalf of us, he, that is God, made this one to be sin. And the outcome of that is what he says at the end. In order that we should know the righteousness of God in him. And I just want to conclude with this. One who has been saved, we are going to know, we are going to experience, we are going to document the righteousness of God always when we are in him. That's how that text ended. That we would know the righteousness of God in him, in this covenantal relationship. So I am supposed to, two things that will change your life so dramatically drastically and that's this when i live my life being a herald being one who speaks about the means how to be reconciled to god when i do that and i always live i ask god god give me discernment so i can know righteous decisions have that righteous discernment so i can behave righteously when this is my reality, I live for the purpose of that ministry of reconciliation. And I live, 
I make righteous decisions doing righteous acts. This is going to bring such a change. And you know, one of the changes, you're going to have that inner peace, that contentment, that joy that, that overcomes all the attacks that the enemy can throw at you. Good news that God revealed Paul that he was faithful to write down to give us a hope and assurance of our eternal future that should bring about a present change in our behavior. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.